hit the other record button. And we are going and put 45 minutes on the clock. And here we go. Welcome to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. I'm your host, Dan Kidder. Our podcast is all about issues facing Southern Utah. Here we will announce your upcoming events, talk with movers and shakers in our community about important issues facing Beaver, Iron, Kane, and Washington counties, and make sure you are kept in the loop with interesting news and commentary of local interest. While we welcome folks from all over, our goal with this podcast is to give residents of Southern Utah a place to find out about issues that affect them. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and also on our Facebook group, What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, and online at whatsreallyhappeningsu.com. You're listening to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast with your host, Dan Kidder. Okay, hey, we've been gone for a while. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, It is a sad day that we have to come together to talk about the horrible slayings that occurred in Enoch, which is our next door neighbor. I often say for those listening outside of the area that uh, Enoch is a suburb of the sprawling metropolis of Cedar City, um, which those who live in Cedar City understand because we are a very small, tight-knit community. But it has made national news. We've seen a statement from the White House. It's been on MSNBC and CBS and ABC and Fox News and CNN. Uh, I even saw it in the BBC and in The Guardian overseas. And for many of those organizations, this is yet another uh, talking point in their push for gun control. But for those of us who live in this community, this is a very, um, it was a kick in the guts when I first heard about it. So joining me today on the podcast uh, by phone, I've got Milton and uh, Rochelle McClelland. They are the owners and founders of Roots Counseling here in Cedar City. And then I also have joining me in the studio, Ms. Caitlin Sorensen, who is the executive director of Canyon Creek Services, uh, which is your main charter is domestic violence, but you do provide a lot of different services. Yeah, mostly domestic violence and sexual assault and then anything that falls under that umbrella. Okay. So what I want to do today is I want to talk with, uh, you know, what's going on in in our community. Let's go through the facts real quick for those who don't know what we're talking about. I don't know that there's anybody left who doesn't. Um, But early uh, on Wednesday, one of our local residents and insurance agent named Mike Haight um, brutally murdered uh, all of his children, his wife, and his mother-in-law. His wife, uh, two weeks before, had filed for divorce. Um, So I guess that definitely makes this a case of domestic violence. It falls into that realm. Um, And I'm I'm not going to go into the salacious details of this. There's a lot of rumors and innuendo flying around, and and I've spoken with law enforcement that have a lot of those details. But I I don't think we need to. I think the broad strokes are horrific enough uh, in itself. So uh, what a way to start the year, just absolutely devastating it just uh, and the really sad part of this i think is, is that the children there were five children and they went from 4 to 17 years of age there were a pair of 7 year old twins and and they covered every age group of our schools so we had elementary junior high school and high school um students that are going to have to deal with the the aftermath of this and so Milton and Rochelle uh, one of the things I'd like to knew, know is, in, and a lot of people are going to try to find, is, is the why of this, right? We all want to find a justification of why this would happen. Uh, what do you think, for those who are trying to understand uh, somebody who's had some sort of a psychotic break like this, what would you tell them uh, when they ask why does something like this happen? So we're always staring at each other who's going to go first. So if we pause for a second, understand that's what's going on. Um, The why is obviously the most asked question that everyone does. And it's the one that's impossible to answer. And the easiest answer that I found is I don't know why. And I can't even possibly understand how someone would do something like this. And so I don't try to spend a lot of time figuring out something that's I can't get into someone else's mind to. What I do try to understand is what are they trying to find out with asking the why? 
what is it they're really looking for? Are they looking for peace? Or are they looking to say this was a, a, a bad act or a, a horrific action that happened? And then we can validate those things. But spending a lot of time on the why just really, it fills our time. It doesn't really actually help anything. Sure. And I, I remember talking to a lot of people immediately after they found out uh, they were telling me things, you know, we made sure the doors were locked, we made sure the kids were in, we made sure the guns were loaded. Um, just the, the fear that went through the small community as a result of this until they found out that uh, the, the uh, murderer was himself killed uh, by his own hand. Uh, there was a lot of fear that went along with this. Um, but I think it brings to us the biggest question is how do we talk to our children and, and explain to them what it is that has occurred here and, and help them to move through this. I think for that um, reference, the school district has done a good job of putting out some talking points and things of that sort. And I think Caitlin, um, they have put out things there as well that I've noticed. Um, however, from my experience with a few of my clients that have reached out um, and a few of our friends who were uh, personally affected by this. Um, it's been interesting to see that the images that are going through their minds kind of creating the worst when we're trying to kind of go through that why question or going through that experience. And so I think allowing them to have their experience and the difference is the validation, like Milt mentioned, how to validate that and say, okay, like, because people tend to be like, well, you're safe. It's okay. Like nothing's happened to you, but we want to validate the fear that's happening in people because they don't understand the why. And yes, we know that we're not in danger because of what the situation was, but that doesn't change that. It just strikes that fear and misunderstanding in people. And we want to help validate that fear and help people recognize that, you know, we, we can understand that we would feel that way through these situations. Right, because even though the, the immediate threat has passed, it still puts questions into people's minds, right? That, how, oh, how do I know that I won't be the next victim? And, and what are the signs and things that I should be looking for with my spouse that I, I don't become uh, the next person to go through this? And, you know, this happens nationwide. And, and I recently had the uh, police chief, or not the police chief, the sheriff and, and the county attorney on to talk about crime in Iron County. And I hear a lot of people saying, oh, see, it's just proof that all these people moving into the area, it's not as safe as it used to be. And, and that's not true. It's When we look at the statistics, statistically per capita, there's been no change to our crime rate. I mean, we have mm -hmm. more people, so obviously we have more instances. Uh, but back in the 80s, we had four people murdered in the Playhouse Bar here in Cedar City uh, by folks passing through from Las Vegas. And, and so... The idea that this has become a less safe community because of the other, the other people moving in, and, and you know, that's just nonsense. It's not true at all. Um, but we're putting together, how this all came about is we're putting together, I started a nonprofit called the Friends of the Iron County Sheriff. And that happened really quickly, way faster than I expected it to. We got our approval from the IRS in three weeks. And actually, the, the approval was in two and a half weeks. It took a few days for the mail to get here to tell us wow. we've been approved. My, my girlfriend is a CPA, said, no, no, that didn't happen. But it did. So it, it kind of caught us off guard. We're not actually prepared, um, but we're in a position to, to help. And we're going to just put all hands on deck to get this to happen. Uh, but one of the things that I, I like to talk about is everybody talks about the cost, you know, what, what we pay law enforcement. Um, but nobody ever wants to talk about what it costs them to do the job. And mm -hmm. in, in speaking with the sheriff and, and other people, I, I can tell you that the law enforcement officers who had to respond to this event are absolutely shaken to their bones. And so we, we talk about the eight dead, but we don't talk about the dozens who are injured and have to carry this trauma with them and, and into those interactions that they have with the community. So part of this fundraiser that we're doing is to cover the funeral expenses of uh, this family. But the other part of that is to cover and make available resources, uh, mental health resources specifically for those first responders who had to respond to this. Milton and Rochelle, how do we help those first responders um, to move through this 
and to heal these wounds that they're carrying with them. I think one first point for me is just um, because these first responders tend to always feel like they have to be tough, I think is letting them know it's okay, you know, to, to not be okay and get the help that they need to process through these events. I think that's, that's huge. Um, sadly, I've been with uh, the police recently at another shooting of one of my clients where, where he took his life. Um, and we spent just as much time talking to the officers like, hey, are you guys doing okay? And trying to check in with them as much as we were checking in with the family and, and all of these things. Because the reality is, is and, it, and it goes into your question of how do we help the kids? This is what secondary trauma is. Secondary trauma is that that trauma that affects everyone around you from the incident. And the first responders, they show up, they do their job, they do their job professionally, and and they try to take care of it. And and I just want to shout out to the to the Iron County sheriffs. They handled um, the family that I was working with, my my client who passed away, and and everything so well that I can't tell them enough. And I happened to be there when they were letting some other victims know, and they were just above uh, professional and responsible. And that carries a toll, right? You have to, to put on that work face to go do those things, but then you don't get to go home and share that with your family because you don't want to share that with your family. You don't want to share that horrificness that you just saw. And you just want to hug your kids more and you want to, you know, be there for them and, and, but you still want to go out and protect the community and serve. So it's a good thing for us as a community to rally around them and just let them know, look, we're here for you. It's okay for you to talk about these things with us. And it's okay for you to, to feel like you can talk about these things. And if it needs to go to the level of counseling, then absolutely go do that. Even if the only thing you do is just vent, and get out, get out what you are angry about the situation that you had to go into a house and see these these awful images of children and 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 the other victims. That's just horrible, and they need a place to to express that as well. And and that's what goes on with the kids too. Most of the time, we just need to get it out of our system. It's just like a a, a, a sickness. Once you can kind of purge it out of your system, it does make things a lot better. Yeah, and I tell you, in 30 years of, of training law enforcement and dealing with law enforcement, uh, you cannot not be affected uh, by the impact of, of it's impossible. the things you see every day, not just something this serious, right. but the burden that you carry with you every day. Uh, you can't not be injured and traumatized, and, and it's going to interfere with your ability to have positive interactions with those contacts that you make in the community on the daily basis uh, if you don't move through that trauma and get that healing uh, and it's so important so any of our law enforcement family that are out there listening Paramedic, to this paramedics yeah the ems uh, that had to respond yep. to this fire department uh, any of the yeah it's okay to talk it's okay to get help it's okay to ask for help let us put our arms around you and show you how much we love you and care about you and want you to heal through this. Um, well, and Dan, if I, if I could, they're not asking any question that's different than the little kid. They're wanting to know the why too. Yeah. They can't comprehend how someone gets to this point. They work with, with people who are committing crimes all day. They aren't working with people who are hitting a breaking point and doing this awful tragedy. So it's a very different world, and it's okay that they're just as confused, just as upset, just as, as confounded by this as anyone else is. Absolutely. And many of them have children in, in the age groups right. that we're talking about. And know about. these kids. And know these particular kids. Yes, they do. So, right. Caitlin, as people try to, to make some sense of this, uh, you know, I, I saw yesterday a Facebook post on uh, on one of the St. George groups saying that, hey, I'm in an abusive relationship. Um, I'm going to file for divorce. What resources are available for me? And immediately the responses were, oh, dear God, did you not hear what happened in Enoch? Um, so what are some things that people who, who may be looking to get out of their current relationship, maybe in an abusive relationship, what are some of the signs 
that because anybody who knew this family said there's no way that they ever saw this this happening. What are some of the signs that people uh, can look for to give them an idea that they could be potentially in danger? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, there are definitely some red flags and signs, but every situation is different. Um, some of the things that we encourage people to kind of pay attention to in those circumstances um, are what they've actually experienced in the relationship. Has the relationship been, you know, what kind of abuse have you experienced? Has it been verbal? Has it been, um, you know, financial abuse? Has there been physical abuse? Um, is there a weapon present? Do you have a weapon? Like, what, what is in the situation um, that, that could be used to harm you or, or that um, could protect you in some circumstance? We call that safety planning. Um, but what people don't realize sometimes is everyone's so eager for victims of abuse to leave their situations. And I get that. I'm, I'm in the same boat all the time. Why did she stay? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Like, why, why are you staying in this situation? And, and that could be a three hour session all on its own. There's plenty of reasons why they do, but we'll put that on the calendar. Let's do it. Um, but, but the, the danger is <laughs> anytime you want to talk about that, we're there. <laughs> yes, they're like, yes, no, there's so many reasons. So the, the hard thing is, 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 in these circumstances is the most dangerous time for a victim of domestic violence is when they leave. And a lot of people don't talk about that. Right. Serving those kinds of orders, getting a protective order, leaving the house, like taking the kids, getting out. That can be the most dangerous time because that abuser has then lost some of their power and control over the situation, which is what they're focused on, which is why they, they abuse. Um, and so, that's when you get a breaking point situation. Um, and so for individuals who are looking to leave those circumstances or, or to be able to make sure they're safe in the situations that they're experiencing, you know, speaking with the safety supports in their, in their realm. So whether they have ther a therapist, whether they are working with an agency like ours, um, at Canyon Creek working with an advocate. Um, even law enforcement has victim advocates, so if maybe their perpetrator has had a domestic violence charge against them, they're contemplating leaving for good and making a plan. We have systems-based advocates here that our agency works with constantly. Um, and, and, and really getting that viewpoint from those individuals to say, hey, how do we make a plan to make sure that, that this is a safe exit? And in all reality, you know, we talk about all the things that could have been done. Um, and I, and I don't want to delve into this situation because I don't want to speculate, but, um, you can still do everything right and there can still be tragedy. Right. And so we have to be really careful of blaming people when we don't know what they did do to, to, to get safe. From a concrete steps perspective, if somebody is in a domestic violence relationship, if they're currently being abused, and maybe they're not to the point of wanting to sever the relationship and, and break ties, is it important for them to contact law enforcement so that at least there's records of this and, and it can be dealt with, those victim advocates can be deployed and involved, uh, or to reach out to you? What, what would be the steps that somebody would take? Maybe they're not at the breaking point yet, um, but they want help. Yeah. Um, documentation is always key, whether you do that by sending an email to like a really private email that nobody has access to. So there's something there and maybe a friend or family member has access to it to be able to have it in case something happens, whether that's working with law enforcement, whether that's working with us, um, making sure there's documentation, there's a record of what's going on is going to help you be able to get services like a protective order, uh, like, you know, a divorce that will allow you to be able to, you know, have access to your kids and, and have those kinds of save things those emails, there. right? Uh, right. Yeah. Texts. But honestly, the, the very first thing is if you're recognizing you're in an abusive situation, you're already ahead of the game because there's a lot of people that don't realize that that's what's happening to them and don't label it as such because it's such a scary term. Um, they want to think, oh, we just we have our issues, or this person's just angry, or he he doesn't do it all the time. But if you're actively recognizing that abuse is happening, we encourage you to reach out. One, make sure you have some kind of a safety plan. If there is an explosive event, and you can kind of see that through the cycles of abuse, you'll have like a a building phase, you'll have an event, and then you'll have a honeymoon period where it's I'm sorry, I'll never do that again. Those kinds of things. Um, make sure you know like. Is there a safe person that you can call uh, if you don't feel comfortable calling law enforcement? Or if you do, 
who's the nearest, you know, how far away is the police station? Do you have access to a vehicle? Do you have access to money? I mean, 90% of the people we work with have experienced financial abuse, which means right. they don't have access to that. So you could have someone that's that's working, making $100,000 a year um, on their own, and I've had this situation, and they were not allowed access to any of their income. And, and that's kind of the pattern of the abuser, right? Mm-hmm. The, the predator... Um, will limit your financial access, will cut off your access to your friends and your support group and your safety net, uh, limit your family access. And so those are all forms of abuse, not just being hit. Yeah, they're the tactics used to control an individual. Gaslighting somebody, uh, belittling somebody, bringing them down. Right. Um, yeah, so these are all things to keep in mind and look for. What, what if I'm a person and I am, you know, a neighbor of someone and I see this, mm-hmm. what is it that I can do? You know, obviously you don't want to stick your nose into somebody else's life and business, And but what can I do? What are the steps that I can do? What are the things I should be looking for uh, to help that person who maybe can't get that help themselves? Yeah. Um, the best thing you can do is be that safe person and let that individual know in a safe circumstance when that abuser is not near that you are safe because that's what they're going to need if they've been isolated and they don't know who to call or reach out to or some of the relationships have been severed being able to reach out to an agency like ours that you don't have to be our friend or family for us to help you that's why we're there if you've been isolated we're here to help but if you have a neighbor that notices something's not right saying hey i noticed there's you know x y or z happening and you don't have to tell me anything if you don't want to, but I'm here if you ever need to talk or if you ever need help or, you know, if you ever need me to take you somewhere or you need a room to stay, like making sure they know that you're available, honestly, is the thing that saves so many lives because when they get to that point where they are ready to leave or there is an event that forces, you know, their hand, uh, maybe there's been abuse towards the kids or something like that, then the first thing they're thinking about is where do I go? What do I do? Who can I call? And you've identified yourself as a safe person. And that's the best thing you can do because they know they're not crazy. They know someone else sees it, that someone else is, is watching their experience. They feel, they feel seen and heard and that will give them the bravery in some circumstances to make that move. And sometimes it will take a very long time before it happens and just keep checking in to say, I'm here for you. you know, it you also need? provides some validation to that person too, right? Because they may be going, am I crazy? Am I really being abused? And then so somebody else seeing it and, and saying, okay, hey, we, we recognize this as well. Mm-hmm. It might give them that validation and that impetus to start looking mm-hmm. at steps that they can do to either get help uh, yeah. to, to fix that relationship or to get out of that relationship. And I'd be interested to hear what, what, Mil- what Milton has to say about that because I know that I spend a lot of time with individuals who are like, I know it's not abuse, but like I'm, there's this stuff happening and maybe like I don't want it to be abuse. And I'm like, it's abuse. You're, you're, experiencing, <laughs> you're experiencing abuse and you just need to name it. So I'd be interested. How much time do you guys well, spend doing the same thing? <laughs> Let, let's just be honest. Who wants to admit these awful things are happening in our lives? Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the time when we're in these bad situations, especially, and, and I'm not talking specifically about this situation, but but this is a, a, a family who was, who was LDS. They were active in their faith. We all kind of look at things in this community of like, oh, if everyone's showing up at church and smiling, everything is good. But if your gut is telling you something and you're the neighbor, then you, you made the statement, Dan, we don't like to stick our nose into people's business. Stick your nose into their business and go say hi. Mm-hmm. Go talk to them. Go befriend them. Go create space for them to be uh, open with you and and asking questions and those questions of, is this okay? Is this like the behavior you're seeing okay? And then you guys get to figure that out together as neighbors. It's wonderful that the community is gonna come together and really support everyone who's been affected by this. And, And that's always a great thing. One of the things that is broken down in society though is we're not as neighborly as we used to be. We're not as connected the way that we used to just hang out on the porches and talk with each other. And we used to know what was going on in people's lives. And because of that, we've, we've created these walls, these barriers of secrecies 
of everyone's life. And, and some of us, I love going home and shutting my door and just being at home and not being bothered. And I've rolled my eyes at people knocking on my door just as many times as anyone else has. And at the same time, I still need to be out there being friends with my neighbors, connecting with them and letting them know that we are, we're people that they can talk to as well. So I, I'm going to disagree with you, Dan. I think part of the thing that we all can do is be better neighbors, be involved, ask the questions. Are you guys okay? Can we actually help you and mean it? Don't just say it. I also think too, and those are incredible points is that, you know, when you make yourself present, it's going to break up the opportunity for those really, you know, escalating events to happen. But also that we as a community don't tolerate individuals yeah. abusing other individuals. That's, That's right. That we call it out when we see it. Right. We're not just checking in with the victim like he spoke to you and, you know, or he grabbed you yeah. hard or, you know, that we're saying like, hey, you know what? I, I, just, I don't think that we should treat each other that way. That's I, not I don't OK. Feel comfortable. You know what? Yeah. I think maybe right. you should leave and, and we're going to stay here while you go, you know, cool down. And sometimes you're not going to see it. Abusers are really great at masking. They are so good at looking like the nice guy. They're so good at looking so good to everybody else. Um, but they'll have you know, you'll have moments, you'll have slip ups, someone feels comfortable. And if you see it, you have to say something. We have to be better about that in our community. Right. We can't just leave that to law enforcement constantly. Here's one of the problems is the abuser may not realize that they're being this malevolent person, right? Like, it's not like they're constantly aware that that what they're doing is bad. They're doing in that moment what they think they need to do. It's not right Mm -hmm. what they're doing. It's not okay but they're not labeling themselves as an abuser. And if someone does, they get defensive. Mm -hmm. So the more we're friends with them, the more we're connected with them, we give them an opportunity to to have someone they can bounce off things to and say, hey, that's not okay. So being a good friend, I I mean, you're you're gonna take that kind of feedback from somebody that you trust and and have that relationship with a complete stranger walking up to you and saying, hey, that's not cool that's going to create a defensive posture. I, I stick my nose into a lot of these situations, um, but my background doesn't make me very easy to push around. Um, so I, I am more brave, I guess, in, in sticking myself into these situations. Um, I've had guns that get pulled. I've had knives that get pulled in and, and the past and sticking my nose into these. So the average person who doesn't have my background doesn't come from the special operations community, doesn't served in combat, hasn't come from a law enforcement background. Uh, they're not going to be as brave, most likely, sticking their their nose at it. Although I'll tell you, I, I know some people, especially small women, um, who are not as well physically or, or as well trained, uh, have no problem. Oh, yeah, watch out for us. <laughs> we are 5'2 and ready to party. That's we're, right. We're there. Uh, yeah, they, they will jump in. They, they're like little chihuahuas sometimes. They'll yeah. just jump right in there. But and you know what no happens problem. when one person, when one person stands up, Dan, you get other people who stand up in the community too. So yeah, absolutely. We call that breaking that, the bystander guess, effect. Exactly. You know? uh, I want to recommend <laughs> to anybody out there. This is a book that I have I've been recommending for years, and I can't tell you how many people have come back to me after reading it and said, thank God that you recommended this book to me. Uh, there's a gentleman out of California. His name is Gavin DeBecker. He runs DeBecker & Associates, and his clients are politicians, uh, movie stars, uh, athletes who have received threats, and he's set up this amazing an- analysis capability and databases to, to verify whether these are actual threats. The U.S. Secret Service uses him. Um, but he's written a book called The Gift of Fear, and it gives you signs. It gives you cases, case by case, where the signs were present and people acted on them or didn't act on them. Um, And it's an amazing book. Uh, Main Street Books keeps it in stock as much as they possibly can because I I, I had the owner of that uh, place read the book. And she's one of the people who came to me and said, thank you for this. And um, Oprah Winfrey says this book can save your life. So I highly recommend that if you are at all thinking like you may be a victim of domestic violence to get this book. Just get it anyway. Anybody should read this book. It's an amazing book. 
So I want to take a minute to talk about uh, some of the uh, resources that are out there. Milton, you mentioned to me uh, earlier that you were going to be providing um, some some counseling resources for folks. T tell us a little bit about that. Um, we got together as a, a ownership team. Uh, we've got a couple non-clinical owners, and we all just decided it, it was the right thing to do to just offer what we could. Um, so we're, we're basically offering uh, two individual or family sessions or even four group sessions um, for anyone who's affected by this. And like I said, a lot of the times, if we can kind of just have a safe place to work this out, that may be all anyone needs. Obviously, if there's more needs, then we can look at helping in other ways with, with those individuals. But we wanted to at least offer something out in the community. And, and we're not limiting this. I, we've, we've got a, a full staff of, of clinicians and, and coaches that are that are ready to <clears throat> to help out with this. So even if it's you know a random person in the community that's just like I don't understand and I just want to talk to someone, we're going to provide that as an opportunity. Um, it's it's not much, but it's it's the least we can try to do. And I noticed that when the Iron County School District put out, they've pr provided a great list of resources. So if you go to the Iron County uh, ICSD uh, schools website, uh, there is a list of, I, there's a mobile mental health task force that's being deployed from the, the governor's office um, and, and just all kinds of resources for students in Iron County, uh, teachers in Iron County to be able to respond to this. Uh, Caitlin, what resources are available? Uh, this is an audience that reaches Beaver, uh, Washington, Kane, Garfield, Iron. I know we have the Dove Center uh, down in Washington County. You're here. What resources are available in this community uh, for people who might be victims of domestic violence? Yeah, so our uh, our agency, Canyon Creek Services, we're the provider for Iron, Beaver, and Garfield counties. Um, we travel to those areas frequently so and help people travel here um, if they need to get out of those areas and into Cedar City. So um, you can call us. We serve all of those areas. The Dove Center serves Washington um, and Kane counties, and so uh, we coordinate with them. We've been coordinating with them this week because sometimes you'll see a spike in calls, um, people who see themselves in some of these situations. Um, and so they're wonderful partners. Um, but really between here and Richfield, we are the only nonprofit community-based organization. Um, you'll also have, if you are from a polygamous background, um, Cherish Families uh, is a wonderful nonprofit that specializes in abuse in polygamous communities. Uh, we also have our um, Jaden Thomas, who works with the sheriff's office. He is the uh, victim advocate for uh, systems based. So if you have had um, charges that, you know, someone's been arrested for domestic violence and you're the victim listed, they can help in those situations. They have some resources. We coordinate with them frequently. Um, Title, the Title IX office at SUU is a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, if you are a student that's experiencing domestic violence um, or any kind of like relationship violence, they have lots of resources that they're eager for people to, to take advantage of and we coordinate with them as well. But if you, can, if you call our agency, we can get you in contact with who you need um, to speak with and, and get you a list. Give us the phone number for them to call in. So our hotline number is 435-233-5732, and that's 24 hours a day. Um, you can also text that number if you don't feel like you want to call. You're welcome to text, and we'll, we'll get you the same resources. All right, and we'll be posting all of these resources um, underneath this podcast on the What's Really Happening SU.com website where we, we post up these uh, podcasts. So we'll make sure that there's a list of those as well. Milton, how do people reach you? We've got our uh, website that you can go to, rootscounselingcc.com. Um, you can message us through our Facebook page, um, facebook.com slash uh, rootscounseling. And then our phone number that I always get wrong. 435-233-2240. <laughs> All right. And there's all sorts of options there. 
So one of the things that has come out of this horrible tragedy, you know, Cedar City is not a, a place that sits on its hands. When there is a need, we get together, we put our shoulders to the wheel, and we come together as a community and help. So there are a variety of events that are going to be coming up. Uh, the I'm president of the Friends of the Iron County Sheriff's, um, and we are putting together an event. Uh, Chris D'Amico, who the drunken butcher, He's the only drunken butcher I know who's on the wagon. Uh, he doesn't drink, but he has a, a spice company here in Cedar City, and he has built a massive towable, uh, one of these huge propane tanks into a grill. Uh, it has deep fryers on it. it has, it's just amazing, and he's made that available to any nonprofit in this community um, that wants to use it for fundraisers. And so uh, Pork Bellies has stepped up. Um, we've had uh, some of the local butchers here in town. Um, Dry Lakes Beef has, has stepped up and donating meat for us to cook on this grill. So we're meeting later today with the Elks Lodge to get final confirmation that we'll be able to use that facility. Um, but I have a pile, a massive pile of uh, prizes, raffle prizes. Um, so we're going to come together on a, a date to be determined and, and finalized, hopefully later today, and we'll put those details out there. Um, but we're going to have a big fundraiser, and, and the, the fundraiser will go 50-50. 50 50% uh, of that will go to the Hate Family Trust um, that was established a while ago um, and, and exists for this family. Uh, for their funeral expenses, and then the other half of that will go to the Friends of the Iron County Sheriff to provide counseling services uh, so that the first responders who dealt with this can can move through and, and work on healing that trauma. But we have another event uh, that I believe is going to be happening. Let me find that right here. It just had it up. Um, it's going to be happening Monday, this upcoming Monday at 6 p.m. at 927. Uh, that would be South Main Street. It's in the uh, Siren Beauty Salon uh, location. Uh, Alachelle is going to be catering cocoa and finger foods. Ron Riddle, one of our city council members, will be there speaking to the community. Um, and then there will be some fundraising opportunities with that. And then we'll be working with some other groups within uh, the town. I believe there's something coming up Tuesday uh, in that same location. Um, and so we're going to be meeting with them this evening as well to talk about those details. So we'll be promoting some of those events that are coming up here, uh, means for you to donate. Uh, I hope to get online uh, donating finalized on our website today. That's been more of a pain in the butt than I thought it was going to be. Uh, being such a new nonprofit, uh, they're like, hey, you're not in the database. You're not. Uh... <laughs> you have to fill out all the forms and all the, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. Um, but I also know that uh, Brooke Twitchell at the Visitor Center, they have a 501c6, which is a political organization. Um, so it's not a tax deductible donation to them, but they have the means to to collect those funds and get them where they need to go. So you can write us a check at the Friends of the Iron County Sheriff, and you can send that to 5 uh, North Main Street, Suite 309, Cedar City, Utah, 84720. And that is a tax deductible donation. I, are you guys collecting funds for this as well? We're working on announcing some potential partnerships um, for, for the family, but okay. right now we don't have something after that. So, so there is a trust that's been set up, and that is the one single point of contact where all those funds should go. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's collecting funds and not funneling them to that single point of contact, don't, don't do that. Uh, because th this is unfortunately a situation where scammers can come out of the woodwork. Uh, when you're dealing with a 501c3 or a 501c6, um, we have a lot of accountability to the federal government to make sure funds go where they are required to go, and our books are pretty much open to the world, anybody who wants to see them. So be careful of some of the GoFundMes that are popping up, and, and I'm not saying those people are, are acting in a in a malicious manner or scammers, but it's very difficult to track that at that point. Plus, GoFundMe takes a ton of those funds and make sure they don't go where they're supposed to go. So the best way to make sure that you are getting funds where they need to go is to write a check. Uh, that way there are no credit card processing fees attached to that. 100% of that goes to where it needs to go. 
All right. Is there anything that we should have talked about that we didn't talk about? Milton, Rochelle, Caitlin? I, you know, I, I think the biggest thing we can all take away is that it's okay to, to hug your kids a little bit more after these events. It's okay to, to be on guard a little bit. It's okay to, to have these feelings. Um, one of my uh, good friends reached out to me yesterday and who's close with his family. And, and I just said, you need to feel all those feelings that you have are telling you how important these people were to you. I think that's the thing that we ignore about feelings is their messages. They're not good or bad. They're there to tell us something. Grief is there to tell us that these people were important to us. They mattered. We loved them. We cared about them. If you're having feelings about that, that's a good thing. And it's also important for people to realize there are stages of grief, but Absolutely. the combination that people go through in dealing with those isn't the same for everyone. And, and how they react to those messages of grief. Talk to us a little bit for a second, if you will, about what those stages of grief are and, and how they can manifest themselves. I always forget the word. <laughs> <laughs> Anger, sadness. Denial. Uh, denial, the bargaining. I'm looking, looking at my wife, and she's got nothing either. <laughs> the, the, the idea that they go in a circle or a linear fashion is, is not true. You're going to bounce around to whatever feeling you need to feel at the time. Your body is a pretty smart device. It's way smarter than we are. And it kind of tells us what we need to feel a lot of the times. You know, when we talk about trusting our gut, that's what we're talking about is letting our body feel what it feels and, and, and informing us. Well, and I think the hardest part is recognizing that shock is where most people are at right now. Yeah. And so those stages of grief don't tend to come in until the shock kind of steps back a bit. Um, because yeah, just disbelief um, and shock are going on. And so I think as the days go on, we'll start to realize a lot more people are angry when we stop to get out of that why place and we start to realize and let things settle in, that's when the grief will be happening and, and we need to be aware of that. All right, Milton and Rochelle, thank you for joining us as you're returning back from your cruise. I appreciate you calling in and Caitlin coming in. We always love having you come in to, to the studio. Um, folks, cry. Hug your kids. Talk to somebody. Um, it is very important as a, a community that we move forward. We're not a talking point uh, on, on somebody's agenda. These are real people that are in our community, and many of us knew um, and, and the first responders who are dealing with this, call me. Uh, talk to a religious leader. Talk to your bishop. Talk to your pastor. Um, talk to Milton and, and Rochelle. Get help. It is okay. We want you to have those resources available. We know you're not Superman. We know that you're hurting, and it is okay for you to seek help, and we hope that you will. Um, God bless everybody who is going through this. This has been, a, a, it was a kick in my guts when I heard this. And so we want to make sure that everybody is coming together, that there are uh, resources available for you in this community if you need help. Um, and we will put all those resources at the bottom of this uh, in the description for this podcast on what's really happening, su.com. Uh, also, uh, you can access this uh, on the, the Facebook group, What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the Facebook group. And we just appreciate everybody listening, and we appreciate you guys coming and, and providing and stepping up, providing these resources to everybody. God bless you all, and thank you all for listening. Thank you for listening to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. We hope that you found this content to be worthwhile. We want to hear from you. So if you have any upcoming event that you'd like to share with our listeners, or if you represent a local group, we'd love to have you come into the studio. Just email us at contact at what's really happening su.com. We're also working on streaming this podcast live and have the ability for folks to call in and ask questions or share items of interest to residents of Southern Utah. Be sure to share this podcast with your friends. And again, thanks for listening.